This podcast is made possible by your support and your donations. Thank you. And by the purchase of my book called Everyday Buddhism, Real Life Buddhist Teachings and Practices for Real Change. I will post an affiliate link to the book on Amazon in the show notes. And if you've already read it, please take a minute to rate and review and also consider purchasing it again for a friend or family member as a gift. Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 94 of Everyday Buddhism, making every day better. I am thrilled Honestly, thrilled to share this conversation with Rain Wilson. Yes, that guy. The actor best known for his role as Dwight Schrute in The Office. In the conversation, we talk about his recent book, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution. Rain is a New York Times bestselling author and three-time Emmy-nominated actor, best known for his role in NB- the NBC's The Office. Besides his many other comedic and dramatic roles on stage and screen, he is the co-founder of the media company Soul Pancake and host of the docu-series Rain Wilson and the Geography of Bliss. Rain is the author of the New York Times bestseller, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual Revolution, plus other New York Times bestsellers, The Bassoon King, My Life in Art, Faith, and Idiocy, as well as the co-author of Soul Pancake, Chew on Life's Big Questions. Some of this you may already know about Rain, I'm sure. But something you may not know, but will learn from this conversation, is that in addition to Rain being a practitioner of the Baha'i faith, he is deeply spiritual. He has studied many religions, and he has a unique ability to capture the deepest of existential philosophy and social behavior in common cultural references and everyday language. His new book took me deep into reflection, but also kept me giggling, of course. It's the same with our conversation. So keep listening. I promise Rain will open your mind, open your heart, and of course, make you laugh. The conversation starts now. Hello, Rain Wilson. Thank you for coming on the show. You know, I've admired your work for some years, like I'm sure many, many, many people have. Um, I admire your ability to seemingly make everyone in the world laugh, (laughs) but I did not know about your, your past history and your deep interest and experience in spirituality. So I must say I was blown away, um, by your book. Um, it was, uh, well, so much fun to read. Uh, in between the giggles, I was making margin notes uh, about how you can seemingly do a deep dive into these uh, existential philosophical concepts um, using everyday cultural references and behavior. So I loved it. Everyday language. Thank you, Rain. Wendy, that was so kind of you to say. Thanks so much. It was uh, really, it was a difficult uh, slog to write the book, but really a lot of fun at the same time and doing just what you said to try and make spiritual conversations accessible, fun, irreverent, funny, applicable, occasionally profound. Um, It was really one of my life's high points. Well, you've hit you all those adjectives. You did hit. You got them all. You got them definitely. Sweet, <laughs> love got it. Them. Um, and, and um, so let's jump in, right? Um, 
we have to, you know, no matter who I'm dealing with, you have to define terms. But in this case, I think defining terms is probably more important than almost any other case. Cause you, you know, I, I there's certain words I refer to. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a Buddhist lay minister and a Buddhist podcaster. And there are certain words I have to be careful about, you know, like the G word and, and the F word faith. And, and sometimes spirituality is tough and soul is always tough. So first of all, what did you mean by spirituality? Well, that's a really important and delicate question. (laughs) And, and I don't know the Buddhist world that well. I have read the writings of the Buddha. Uh, I've read some texts about Buddhism. I've listened to some podcasts about Buddhism, <laughs> but I'm no authority at all. Um, but I will say that in defining spirituality, I kind of went with a pretty straight up dictionary term, which is uh, uh, being concerned with the non-material aspects of life. So, uh, because to some people, spirituality means spirits like ghosts, and <laughs> and to some, it's it's ghosts and angels and and chakras yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, I don't want to lump all that together necessarily, but and to some people too, spirituality is kind of a vague feeling. It's just uh, simply a feeling state of feeling peace, serenity, and connectedness. That's also not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the very real idea that, and I quote uh, Father Pierre Tejard de Chardin in this quite often, which is we're not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience, which I believe is in alignment with much of the Buddhist thought and, and teachings. But our reality is spiritual. We're in these fleshy bodies for 70, 80, 90, 100 years if we're lucky, and going through all kinds of spiritual experiences, their soul experiences, their experiences of connection, of transcendence, of yeah. love, of unity, of profound uh, beauty and inspiration. And that's kind of what spirituality is and that what I feel like contemporary American society is not talking about enough and why I wanted to dive in. Absolutely. And, you know, and so there's one more term. Um, Okay. I'm I'm sorry about the uh, sort of the housekeeping we have to do here with uh, defining terms. But one more term I think is pretty cool that we should look at is the soul. You know, I'm sure... I think you even mentioned this in the book. I don't know. It's it's in my memory that that there was that you said that there's some question whether Buddhists believe in a soul um, because of no self, <clears throat> and because you know Buddhism was actually a revolutionary response to Hinduism, and Hinduism was all about the soul and the continuation of the soul. But I think that's um, much like uh, a lot of people say the Buddha. Yeah, uh, we Buddhists don't believe in God, and 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 that's actually well. Let me just say it: it's baloney. Um, the the, Bo- the Buddha never said there is no God. He said he he refused to reply directly to one of his disciples mm-hmm. when asked the question because he said mm-hmm. it was sort of irrelevant to our world. Soul is a similar thing, okay? Because mm-hmm. no self, I don't think. And this is just my opinion now, but no, no self doesn't mean no soul. But what do you mean by soul? Yeah, um, I wish I were a little smarter in, in being able to define this term, because I suppose I'm a little bit dualistic uh-huh. uh, in the sense that, I mean, I don't believe that like body and soul um, are completely separate, mm-hmm. but I guess for a a larger question and one that Buddhists dive into a great deal is what is consciousness? So um, for the materialist, consciousness resides completely in the brain and is um, neurological impulses and uh, chemicals and and electronics zipping around the brain. And it's it's an illusion really of the material 
uh, experience. Right. Uh, the idea that consciousness is this 3D surround sound, emotion filled, memory filled, profound experience where you know you smell a flower and it reminds you of when you were 12 years old and it fills your heart with love and um compassion and writing operas and poetry and finding beauty in the world like that this is all kind of an illusion of uh neuro electrical chemical impulses dancing around the brain so that's the materialist standpoint right um i suppose for the total dualist you'd be like well most of the, of consciousness is um it just completely continues as is when the body <laughs> falls away and you're like a ghost like casper the friendly ghost and you have the same consciousness moving forward so i'm not really talking about either of those i think that um there are mysteries of consciousness that will continue when our material um uh experience ends uh i don't think it will be exactly the same um from my faith tradition the baha'i faith there's a wonderful analogy which is the baby in the womb and the baby in the womb is developing all of its parts that it needs for this physical world right does a baby in the womb have consciousness you know at seven eight nine months kind of can you know it has some impulses it can feel longer i suppose it can you can hear music playing outside the womb etc um but is it you know is it writing poetry no um but it is growing what it needs for this worldly experience and in the in the baha'i tradition metaphorically speaking we are growing our spiritual arms and legs and fingers and toes and eyes and ears that we will need for our next evolution, um, you know, our, mm -hmm. in, in nirvana, in arriving, um, some might look at it as going to heaven, but in our next plane of existence. So whatever that transition is, is the soul. I mean, I, I come at the end of the book and I use the, uh, the metaphor of waves on the ocean, which is right. a popular one in both the Baha'i faith and, and in, and in, I guess more Vedantic thought, but the fact that we have an individual identity as a wave and the wave has a much larger identity as the sea. And that's maybe how I would explain the no self idea that you can, you know, can you say to a wave, you have a self? Yeah. Can you say to a wave, you have no self? Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. So that's, yeah. that's as close as I can take you. No, no, that's great. And it, it, actually the wave, the wave ocean uh, analogy is used quite frequently in Buddhism as well, too. So it must be mm. a it must be pervasive <laughs> across mm. all. all. <clears throat> you mentioned the Baha'i faith, and that was the next question I was going to get at, because mm. I'm familiar with Baha'i. I know a lot of people or many people are not right. It's 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 not I don't think it's it, that. um prevalent in especially in west in the west um so can you give us a short well let's say just a quick overview summary of the baha'i faith and maybe your spiritual bio within that sure so um i'll start with my spiritual bio within that so i grew up a member of the baha'i faith so when I was born in the hippie days in the late 60s in Seattle, when my parents were living on a houseboat and painting murals and going to poetry readings, um, they became members of the Baha'i faith. And so I grew up a member of the Baha'i faith. So um, I left it for a long period of time, like many young folk do, and I wanted to go to New York City and party and rage and go crazy and be an actor and not have to think about God and spirituality and morality and all of that nonsense. Um, but in a nutshell, and it's, again, I want to say just like if someone were to try and sum up Buddhism, like in a nutshell, it would be really <laughs> difficult. You know, you could spend your entire life studying it and not get to the bottom of, of what it means. But the Baha'is, Baha'is believe in a God. So Baha'is believe in a, in a, all powerful uh higher power 
this is not any kind of personification. It isn't like any kind of like a man with superpowers or a man with a beard or man at all. Um, uh, this kind of God um, is called the unknowable essence in the Baha'i faith. So it's, uh, it's beyond comprehension, beyond time and space. Um, would it be Atman or Brahman in, 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 I, I don't know exactly. Uh, that would be more of a Hindu. Uh, That's definition. a Hindu thing. Yeah. 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 But, th but actually, but, um, the unknowable ahead, essence is, is, is probably what, well, I wasn't around to hear the Buddha's answer, so I'm not going to speak for him, but I think that's kind of what he was getting at when he said, I'm not answering that question because right. I don't know who said it, but they said, you know, if, if you if you if you try to define God, you don't know who God is. Right. Or what God is. You can't. Yeah. It's it is an unknowable lesson. And I and I love the way you describe Buddhism as being a response to Hinduism in a similar way that Christianity was response to Judaism and a and a reinvention in, in a revolutionary context. Because back in the Hindu days, every village had its gods. Every every region had its god. Well, which god do you worship or which right. statue to which god do you believe in more? In our village, we pray to this god and offer this to this god. What what so it was this constant debate of which god is best and who has more power and you know, etc. and so to come into that and say let's just not even worry about gods, let's worry about suffering and and uh and the human experience is truly truly re as revolutionary as it gets. So going back to the Baha'i faith, Baha'is believe in this unknowing, unknowable essence, rather, and that this unknowable essence sends down specially appointed uh, spiritual teachers uh, throughout humanity's um, growth cycle. This unknowable essence wants humans to grow and mature spiritually. So through time, going way, way back to Zoroaster, to Lord Krishna, to Abraham, you know, as far back as we can possibly go, and Moses, and then the Buddha, and Jesus, and Muhammad, and now Baha'is believe in a new sp spiritual divine teacher named, who goes by the title of Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God, that these teachers are kind of updating this message, kind of like when you have a computer or an iPhone and you get these <laughs> updates right. to the operating systems. You're not scrapping the existing operating system right. and putting in a whole new one. You're just having like updates. And if you track the spiritual message and vision through these teachers, it gets gradually more expansive, shall we say. And Baha'is believe that Baha'u'llah's most recent spiritual message for humanity is one of, uh, redemption for all of humanity to bring humanity together in unity and love and mutual service and to create a world where you know uh, of peace and joy and uh but but in a practical sense in practical terms like what do we need to do practically to get there so as a baha'i i am a buddhist as a baha'i i'm a christian as a baha'i i'm a muslim right. and i do you know, read, study, learn from with great humility, all of the great holy teachers of the past and seek to apply those to my life, my life personally, and also seek to make the world a better place. And actually anyone who reads your book, buy the book, um, anybody who reads the book um, will notice how familiar you are with all the different religions. You, you, you're, a, you're able to... Um, I don't know whether you're rattling it off or researching, but it sounds like you're rattling off everything you've studied over the years, which is quite impressive, really, because most people barely scratch the surface of a uh, surface of one, let alone all of them. So that was pretty cool to me. Um, and now that we're on the subject of the G word and God, um, Please, please, please share your story of the notorious G.O.D. show. <laughs> the show, okay. <laughs> well, share share that pitch story because I think that was I I laughed probably louder at that one than a lot a lot of a lot of your stories. <laughs> um, uh, gladly, gladly. So, 
for me on my personal journey, trying to understand if there was a God and if so, what that God meant um, and what that meant for my life. If there was some kind of unknowable essence force, God consciousness beyond all comprehension, beyond time and space, like what does that mean for my life and my choices in my life? Um, it was a very important part of my journey. So, and I took many years to kind of mulling that over. So when I had the uh, production company and digital media company, Soul Pancake, which some people might be familiar with, we did Kid President and a bunch of other online fun shows. Um, when I we pitched a show that I created the idea called The Notorious G.O.D. Um, <laughs> And which was just a modern day exploration of God. Like, okay, we know that God is not an old white man with a beard on a cloud, kind of scowling down like Brian Cox from Succession, um, <laughs> you know, judging and giving favors to his chosen people and hating on his unchosen people. Like, we all know that's poppycock. Um, but if we're going to remove... Uh, God from any of those human qualities and, you know, and wrestle with this question, let's explore it. What would God look like through a lens of AI? What does God look like from an atheist perspective or not right. look like, you know, from, from a Buddhist perspective, from different tribal and indigenous cultures? Like, let's just explore the concept of a creator. It's kind of the, the biggest possible human question. And so we pitched it all around all the streaming services and, they all rejected it, of course, and I knew they would. But, you know, from a couple of them, including Netflix, we got the feedback that it's just too controversial. <laughs> <laughs> so that, which is what's so hysterical is like, you just turn it on and there's some dating show where they're like throwing garbage at each other and getting drunk and sleeping yeah. with each other's, you know, neighbors and nannies and, and whatnot. And like, that's fine. That's fine yeah. for contemporary society. But, uh, but, uh, a thoughtful exploration of God is is not, and that that is just utterly preposterous, and shows kind of where we are as a as a culture right now. Absolutely, I mean that's sort of like the turning point of why we need a spiritual revolution, right? That's the deal, right? Right there. Um, to me, one of the most important concepts, and you know, it may not have been your central theme, but it seems like the central pivot point around which the book was um, uh, sculpted was mm -hmm. uh, how you classified spiritual, and you started the book this way, how you classified spirituality within two aspects. But the two aspects were characterized by uh, older shows, uh, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> not, not, mm -hmm. To me, not so old, but uh, no, um, Kung Fu and Star Trek. Um, can you explain, set this up for us to the audience? Sure, sure. Well, I kind of came to understand the world through television because I was kind of <laughs> raised by a television set in the 70s and 80s. And um, when I was trying to frame spirituality and our spiritual journeys I used as a metaphor two of my favorite TV shows from the 70s like you said Star Trek and Kung Fu so for those who are not familiar Kung Fu is about a Shaolin monk who has left the monastery to go to the old west mm -hmm. uh, the wild wild west so uh, Kwai Chang Kane is his name and he's looking for his half brother Danny Kane and he was raised in a Shaolin monastery, so he knows martial arts, certainly, but he's also been raised in Taoist philosophy, Confucian philosophy, Buddhist philosophy, and uh, with a great deal of, uh, of wisdom. And he's going about the wild, violent Old West, looking for his brother, and he's in, he encounters chaos and violence and aggression at every turn, you know, drunk, racist cowboys and you know, greedy landowners, and and he has to use and tap into his spiritual uh, reservoir to master himself and master others, um, to seek to be like a, 
like Tai Chi, you know, like the willow and the breeze against these hostile <laughs> elements. And of course, there has to be an ass kicking fight every episode. So there's a couple of those thrown in. And he shares his wisdom as he goes along his way. So I set that up as like, this is one part of the spiritual journey. And that has to do with um, our individual uh, seeking of wisdom, bettering ourselves and seeking to go about our days with, um, with compassion, and gentleness, and humility, and love, building bonds, and, and enriching our, for lack of a better word, souls as we go about our day. So that's part one. Star Trek is the other element of spirituality, which I think get, we give a lot less shrift to, mm -hmm. which in my mind is the most spiritual television show of all time, even though it's about technology, but humanity in Star Trek has solved all its problems. Let's yeah. not forget that there was a terrible World War III that precipitated the arrival of the Federation. And racism has been solved. Sexism has been solved. People are embraced for their diversity. Um, they're loved. They're all in, living in harmony with nature. Um, income inequality has been solved. And in those kind of injustices, we live in a very just, civil, peaceful society. And so because of that, we are able to rise to our highest challenge as a species, which is, in Gene Roddenberry's case, is to go seek out new life and new civilizations and, and kind of spread peace, love, and technology um, and <laughs> interracial unity, interspecies unity um, as we do so. So to me, that's a very spiritual message, which is humanity having achieved spiritual evolution and um, then heading out to uh, fulfill its highest calling as a species. So this is the other part of the spiritual uh, drive, I believe, which is how do we make the world a better place? You know, I think one mistake that Buddhists make a lot is they seek to use Buddhism as a tool to bring serenity to their hearts and they right. stop there. And if you read through the Dhammapadas and the lectures of the Buddha and the Pali Canon and the everything, like you, you see how much the Buddha is talking about reducing the suffering of others and spreading the message of the Dharma and and it being and working and being in service to others. And sometimes, especially in contemporary American Buddhism, we kind of lose that. And it's kind of this Eckhart Tolle, like just be in the moment, take deep breaths, find more peace, and then enjoy your life more. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. And that a lot of that has to do with the Kung Fu, Kung Fu path. But how do we elevate humanity? Eight billion of us on the planet, one or two billion of those are, are suffering and below the poverty line. And this has to do with social justice and it has to do with, you know, serving the poor and maximizing our own spiritual qualities to try and make the world a better place, like you're trying to do on this great podcast of yours. And so those two elements of the spiritual journey have a dance. There's, they're kind of like a yin right. and a yang. They, they feed each other. We nurture our souls. We find tranquility and peace. And, and then we share that. Because of that, our spiritual batteries are charged and we can give more service to others. And in giving service to others, that actually charges our batteries in a whole different way. And there's the dance between the two. And so I really wanted to, the spiritual revolution uh, in large part is a, a, a deeper conversation having to do with how do we take spiritual qualities and ideas and philosophies and help transform systems in the contemporary world to make them better and more spiritually arrived. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I agree with your sort of characterization of Buddhism, especially from the the uh Theravadan perspective you know the 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 dhammapada the, the 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 original sutras the mahayana perspective although is a little different but yet bo both are founded on the three jewels which are buddha dharma and sangha and i think what in a, in a, a complete misappropriation of what buddhism should be in our current culture they've thrown sangha out 
like you talk mm. about, they throw they threw spirituality out with the religious bathwater. Yes. I think I think they threw Sangha out and said, mm. This is all about me. If I just sit here gazing at my navel and feel all chill, all's good, right? That's that's the whole point. Or mm. what's worse, in my opinion, is is the ubiquitous mindfulness cult um if you will and i don't mean that in a really you know accusatory way but it's bec- that became just as commercial um as everything commercial in other words it was a it was misappropriated and adopted by by um by corporations and by the army i mean they chain they train um army recruits in mindfulness based activities so they can kill better now we can be mindful of a lot of things right Mm. but if we're not mindful of the sangha which doesn't just mean the monks and nuns it means because buddhism is founded on interdependence or interbeing then we have to be cognizant of everyone in the world Mm. so you i think you totally nailed it with what you just said Mm. That's beautiful. And I hadn't heard that before about the song. I hadn't thought about Sangha as community and building community and serving community. Uh, oftentimes Sangha is like the community of Buddhists that right. get together to meditate together. But right. Sangha is a greater community. It's your, how do you bring the Dharma into your family? How do you bring it, you know, to the poor? How do you bring it to the refugees, you know? And that's the greater Sangha. It is, and absolutely. And not everybody sees it that way. That's definitely how I see it. Um, Because I implied in that message to me was always, if if we're all interdependent, Sangha can't just be this little circle of Buddhists or Mm. feeding the monks or feeding the nuns like it was back in in the original days or or it is Mm. in native Buddhist cultures, you know. But unfortunately, like I said, I think Buddhism and and the message of Buddhism has been broadly misappropriated in our Western culture. So um, point taken, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> um, one of the things that, another thing that I, I wanted to talk about was your, and you do this a lot in the book, which is what I love about your writing. It's sort of, it's like taking a, taking a little trip into rain's brain right <laughs> <laughs> and i loved that um i love sort of i've always loved writers to me because it's a lot like poetry and i love poetry and i love haiku and so i love writers who don't put yield and stop signs up they just kind of flow in a stream of consciousness mm. wherever their brains go and i love that um but you did this sort of introspection of your own internal narrative about the word sacred or what is Mm. sacred that is so Mm. important i mean i'm just going to say just say for me because i think it's good to share because it'll get people asking themselves what's sacred to you right maybe my listeners would want to say what's sacred to me because i think the word sacred shouldn't be thrown out with the word holy. I mean, there's so many sacred things in life. And to me, that's the common, the ordinary, the silly, that it's all sacred. Like mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. things that make life good, things that make life fun, things that make me happy, things that make me so happy that I'm trying to make other people happy, um, things that make me love and have compassion for others. So a few things that make me happy And a few things that I consider sacred are awe over how amazing things are built, like skyscrapers and bridges. I'm always, awe is a cool part of sacred, I think. Um, Mm. uh, An ant carrying twice its weight across Mm. my driveway. It's like, how the heck? How do they do that? Um, uh, Cicadas, we're in cicada season here. The the pure... um, the pure loudness of cicadas are amazing. Mm. They're little insects and they, it's like nothing could. Well, and the roar of cicadas is every, however many years it is, um, is a mating call. And then they 
furiously mate and then they die. Die, <laughs> which isn't so cool. And then the little baby cicadas come up and do the same thing. Like it's uh, it, it's, it's such a mysterious uh, uh, yeah, cycle. I've, I, I, it's so true. And I've always had this thing about cicadas. So I always look forward to this time of year because there's that roar again. And the baseball in my backyard. These are things that to me are sacred. So mm. uh, which is what I think, you know, you talk about haiku in the book and Basho, thank you very much. And um, which I think this is what haiku is all about. It's what they're getting at. It's like, where's that little sacred bit in life as you go through your life? So what do you have to say about sacred? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just, I can't say anything better than what you just said. Honestly, that was really beautiful. I love it. And so I have a chapter called The Sacred Pilgrims. And in it, I mean to only elicit the conversation that we're having right now. Like what is what is sacred? And I and I love that that connection between awe and sacred. Like anything yeah. you can feel awe over has a sacredness to it. It's the it's wonder it. of creation and perception of of creation. That the fact that we get to witness an ant carrying five times its weight, that we can do that with our eyeballs as light is surrounding it and birds are singing and we're witnessing this ant, um, that's sacred. So I wrote the chapter because as a Baha'i, I went on a pilgrimage to the Baha'i holy sites in, uh, in Israel. In Northern Israel is the Baha'i holy land. And that's where the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith Baha'u'llah was buried. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I wrote, a, you can find it online somewhere, I wrote an essay that's not in my book called Me and the Prophet, because how recent Baha'u'llah was, is when I was a baby, there was a guy in his 90s who, when he was a teenager in the 1880s, had met Baha'u'llah in Northern. Wow. Yeah. And then he came to Seattle and I'm an infant, and he held me on his lap, and he was talking about the Baha'i faith, and this was a guy who had met the founder of this religion. So that's, wow. I, I talk about, I'm like, I'm two degrees away from the prophet of this world religion that now has six million adherents and is rapidly growing in certain areas in the world. So, but it's a holy site for a number of different reasons for the Baha'is, and, and you know, it's a shrine, you know, um, it's where the prophet is buried. There was a great deal of history of the Baha'i faith that's there. It's also sacred because that's where the Baha'i administrative center is for the world. So it has a special uh, sacredness and, um, and majesty. And it's very, very beautiful. The, the gardens are, are just immaculate and gorgeous. And, and I, as I was on this pilgrimage, and you think about that word pilgrimage, because I was yeah. there to a pilgrim goes to a place to experience the sacred and the holy specifically. Mm -hmm. I was there to not as a tourist, I was a pilgrim. So I got back home and was like, gosh, there's just nothing sacred around me. And that's my own fault, right? Like I'm just, I'm on the phone, I'm on the Zooms, I'm, uh, I've got appointments, I've got to pick up my dog poop, I've got to take my kid to the doctors or, you know, and I was like, I really missed that sense of the sacred. And so for me, it was more of a conversation that we can all have to say, how do we find the sacred in our life and our lives and nurture it and the holy and the awe and curiosity that comes with it? How can we connect with, you know, is everything sacred? If we perceive it in a certain way, does it become sacred? Um, you know, is a strip mall with a Taco Bell and a Pizza Hut and a dumpster and a <laughs> liquor store, is that sacred? Doesn't mm -hmm. feel like it, but I don't know. I mean, I, I use the example of there's a restaurant. I went on my first date with my wife uh, in 1990 uh, in Seattle called Sea Tie, and it's still there, probably different owners, but it's been there forever now, 30 some years. And we had a lovely first date having Thai food. And to me, when I go to Seattle and I drive by it sometimes, I'm like, oh, that that's sacred to me. Like there's a part of my heart is captured in this dingy little Thai restaurant that's there to make money. It's not there to provide some service. So 
it's a conversation we should be having. And it, I do bring it back to Basho and this idea that is so beautiful at the time where the haiku poets would travel around medieval Japan, witnessing nature and writing about nature and witnessing the divine in nature, mm. uh, whatever that means, however you want to qualify that, uh, the divine, the beauty, the majesty, the transcendence, the eternal, um, just the beautiful, and then writing about it, creating, so making art, and then leaving it at the shrines, at the various yeah. shrines, the Shinto shrines and Buddhist shrines, and the sacred places and visiting those sacred places. So the, the sacred, the arts, nature, God, eternity, beauty, it was all interwoven in such a, a majestic way that we don't live our contemporary lives. And to me, like Basho taking his pilgrimage, because he would take his pilgrimages right. from shrine to shrine to shrine, leaving haiku in his wake, um, is how we should all be living our lives and not separating into boxes. Oh, art is over here. Nature's over uh, here. Beauty, eternity, and transcendence is over here. And sacred spaces are over here. But how do we integrate all of that? Absolutely well said. And I like how about that, like putting everything in little boxes, you know, we all, um, my teacher's father, who my teacher teachers, um, always said, we want to put a period on everything. And once we put a period on the end of everything, we, we, it ceases to exist. So as soon mm. as we label something like, well, this isn't sacred. It's a strip mall for God's sakes. It can't be sacred. You know, then, mm. then it can't be sacred because we just said it couldn't be sacred. So therefore it can't be sacred. Right. And I, I sort of the way I think about these things is like, um, um, it, it, everything is sacred or nothing is, <laughs> you know, that's really mm. kind of the way. So do you think that a strip mall with a Taco Bell and a dumpster and a liquor store is sacred? It can be. It was to you because they're the Thai restaurant. Um, well, OK, I'll give you one. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I'm not I'm not a vegan. Um, and there was a, a, a lobster shanty up the street from us. And it was in an attached building to a gas station. I'm not kidding you here. It was the fish shanty. I mean, you didn't eat there, but you bought your fish. And there's the fi the fish shanty and the gas station. Mm. And everybody in the neighborhood loved this because they would run up to the East Coast. You know, I'm in Rochester, New York, so we're not like a hop, skip and a jump. So they'd get in their refrigerator trucks. They'd go to Maine or whatever and come back and load up the the freezers or and and the refrigerators at, at the uh, gas station and, and everybody in the neighborhood and everybody in the broader neighborhood was like well, where where did you get that where did you get that lobster where did you get this where did you get that and and they'd always say well at the gas station so <laughs> that that was to, that to me felt pretty sacred by the way i mean it was but to a vegan, that could be the place of mass death of lobsters. It, it, it absolutely <laughs> that it absolutely. It's like the Auschwitz of lobster farms or something, and it could be an abomination. It, it absolutely could. So I guess it, it again it be, it depends on how you label it. You know that's mm. I that's really a, the I think Buddhism in a nutshell is we don't apply labels to anything because everything is empty. You've heard of emptiness in Buddhism, right? Emptiness mm -hmm. just means everything is interdependent and impermanent. So whenever you label something, you stop the flow of interdependence and impermanence. So mm. to me, sacred enough. So um <laughs> so anyway, uh since I'm all about everyday buddhism clearly um as my lobster story illustrates um what what do you think we can do every day right to find the sacred in our days weeks and months i mean i know and we can go we're going to go into this later a little bit about your fundamentals the 10 fundamentals of your new religion um but um 
just off the top, what what do you think we all can do to find our sacred? And without taking pilgrimages, because not everybody can take a pilgrimage to right. the Mideast, right? So, well, listen, you Buddhists do this better than anyone. So <laughs> I I don't know that I have any direction to give the average practicing Buddhist who is far more grounded in the dailiness of sacred finding. You know, I will say that 50 feet out this window here is this bench that I meditate on yeah. most mornings. And that's a sacred pilgrimage as well to my meditation bench. And there's hummingbirds and, and all old olive trees and it's gorgeous. And we can all have the equivalent of that, the place that we go to find tranquility, stillness, peace, to connect with the emptiness, the empty mind, the beginner's mind. Um, so I think that's uh, a really important. And I, I imagine that 90% of your listeners have a daily practice, probably stronger than my own daily practice. Well, so I, I just want to say not so. I, I have a lot of listeners and a lot of them are new to Buddhism. So everything is okay. new to them. So don't. All right. All right. <laughs> well, a contemplative practice is uh, crucial to anyone's spiritual path and journey. Amen. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're a Muslim or a Christian or, or Jewish or, or Buddhist or Jew, Jewish, Jewish, <laughs> um, or Baha'i, but to find that stillness and that eternity and to recognize that we are not our thoughts and we're not our feelings. Um, our consciousness is something greater than that and and yet lesser than that at the same time yeah. um, is really important. And so that's part of it. And I think if we can incorporate more ideas around the sacred into that practice, I think that's great. For me as a Baha'i, I also feel that prayer is important. Yeah. And let me define prayer. Prayer is uh, when I when in the chapter the notorious God I talk about this concept of sky daddy. So I want to remove God as far as possible from the idea of sky daddy. We're not asking sky daddy for favors. Right. Like we ask like when we're 7 years old and we're like dad can I have a lollipop? It's not uh that's not what prayer is, but expanding our heart consciousness to a beseeching communication with the uh, power of the universe. Um, uh, Anne Lamott has a beautiful book called Help, Thanks, Wow. Those are the yeah. three prayers. So you're asking for help. You're, you're, ask, you're beseeching gratitude. Thanks. Thank you for what I have. You know, my senses, my health, you know, my Toyota, you know, whatever. <laughs> and then wow, what you talked about, which is awe mm -hmm. of the beauty and wonder of not only nature, but just the experience of being alive. Like, wow, I get to do this. That's so important. That's what we can do. And right. then I think, how do then, how then do we tap that to help others? And that doesn't yeah. mean you've got to join a nonprofit. It doesn't mean you have to go to Ukraine or, you know, some poor village, you know, in Laos somewhere to do that work, although that's fine. But in your own way, in your family, in your community, at the grassroots, how can you tap that reservoir to be to maximize your service to others and to find our identity through service? And uh, if we all were kind of in instead of being self-centered, we're more other-centered, mm -hmm. um, we could affect a much greater transformation. It's it's a cliche, it's easier said than done. It's like, yeah, 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 whatever. But truly it it really is. You know, if if we have 300 Americans, excuse me, 300 million Americans, you know, and if you know 8 million are doing, you know, good for others, uh and we could make that 80 million, then you know, things really might change and 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 we can get more specific and systematic in that. It doesn't just necessarily mean like, oh, I ex have an extra half of a sandwich. I'll give it to this homeless guy. <laughs> but we can be systematic in our pursuits to achieve ma maximum impact in that work.
Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of it just takes thinking about it. You know, we have uh, we talk a lot about intention in Buddhism. So like if you set mm. an intention in your morning, that mm. includes some of this sort of service practice, which, by the way, Baha'is and um, Catholics have it all over Buddhist on this one. I can tell you that um, service is not our watchword, even though I do talk about Sangha. Um but yeah, if if we set an intention and like I'll add to your prayer uh, um, in meditation, I think meditation and prayer, I, I agree with you. It, it is combined and it's very important that it be combined because it's like the the it's sort of non-dual in, in placing it that way because it's sort of like breathing like in and out, in and out. Right. <laughs> right. Mm, so mm. Um, but yeah. Um, in in the in the type of buddhism i practice and just like the you know all the different sects of christianity when people say what do buddhists they ask me what do buddhists think about this i always say okay first of all there are there is nothing as a buddhist there are hundreds of different types of buddhism uh, i happen to practice a type of buddhism called shin buddhism it's a japanese mahayana buddhism in and guess what? We don't, meditation isn't necessarily a central part of our practice, but chanting is, which is a lot like meditation and a lot like prayer. I think of it as both. It's kind mm. of a combination of both. Mm. Mm. So um, so anyway, so I, I loved what you said about that. Um, so let's touch on the, if you would like, uh, 10 fundamentals of the new soul boom religion. Um, there are 10, um, I'm not going to list them here in the, in, in, because of time constraints, but you can list them if you want, or you can lump them together, or you can do whatever you want, because after all, you formed this religion. So, Hey, you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I should, I should explain what you're discussing here. So yeah, I have a chapter called, Hey kids, let's build the perfect religion, which is, this was really an exercise of not actually starting a new religion, but really an exercise, a thought exercise, because so many young people especially have jettisoned anything and everything to do with what quote unquote organized religion. Right. By the way, I want to say, and, and I think it, 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 your, most of your listeners know this, but some may not, like practicing Buddhism in uh, Theravada and Mahayana, both like in Southeast Asia, let's say, is very, 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 very different than Absolutely. practicing Buddhism in the Western world and what that means. You know, it's it's very easy for us to sit here and, you know, read a little Eckhart Tolle and, and say, oh, we don't believe in God. But, you know, millions of Buddhists every day are laying down sacrifices and offerings to gods, you know, now. Exactly. And they have you know, little ghost houses in their backyard, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're giving they're giving cooking oil to this god, and they're blending Hindu gods with with the Buddha and making offerings at statues of the Buddha. These are right. millions and millions and millions of people. We can't just denigrate Buddhism and say, well, they're wrong or they're misguided or whatever. That's it's a different way of practicing this ancient you know faith, this twenty five hundred year old faith, and um, but. Anyway, in building the perfect religion, I, I, there, there are many lists that I created. Number one, yeah. I created a list of 10 universals of, of, of all faiths. And this applies to both Buddhism and Islam. It's very easy to look at like the differences between, let's say, Buddhism and Islam. There's many differences. Right. But it's, it, it's a little more challenging to look at the universalities or commonalities. But I think it's really important to do that if you're on a spiritual journey. The seeking of transcendence, you know, service to others, witnessing beauty, there, you know, some idea of there being something beyond the material uh, is super important. These are in every religious tradition. The list goes on and on. So then I create this list of 10 qualities of a perfect, you know, religion. And again, to, it's been very funny. There's a lot of born again Christian articles about my book and they're like, well, this is a good idea, but it's not right because it doesn't accept Jesus Christ as the way and the truth and the light. And it doesn't <laughs> yeah. accept the father, the son and the Holy ghost. And therefore it is, 
it is of Satan. And it's like, well, no, guys, I'm just, it's a thought exercise. Um, and I don't even remember them. I don't have the book in front of me right here. I but... have, I have them listed. If you would like, okay, me to do... go ahead, but... rattle a few off. Okay. Higher power, but I have to I have to say how you wrote it because this made me laugh out loud. A big guy gale force creator thingy um, that has our best <laughs> interest in mind and is not Voldemort. So that's one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> life after death, power of prayer, transcendence, community, a moral compass, the force of love, increased compassion, service to the poor, and a strong sense of purpose. Or the sort of thing I think I'll say is what we all seek, a sense of meaning, something that's bigger than us, our little mm. goofy brains and what we want to do every day. Something bigger than us. And that yeah. and the Dharma, I mean, one could say the Dharma incarnate is is something bigger than bigger than us that might be a kind of a higher power to turn to. But thanks for refreshing my mind in that. And I and I do want to say too that um, you know, uh, one of those is a moral compass. And if people have read the Buddha and you talk about, you know, the Eightfold Path, a lot of it is morality. A lot it of it is just straight up morality. Absolutely. Do the right thing, not the wrong thing. Do the, the selfless thing, like give to others and, you know, you don't succumb to rage. And there's, there's all kinds of, you know, moral teachings in on the Buddhist path. And, and I think a lot of Western Buddhists, again, they really separate themselves. They're like, well, we're not anything to do with morality. It's like, well, well read, go to the source guys, go to the mm -hmm. source. Um, and, uh, but I'd love to hear your take on that. What, what, what is, um, a sense of moral compass. Yeah. In terms of, uh, a, a Buddhist, Buddhist practice, practice. I'm, I, I really seek to, to learn and understand that because it's something I, have I haven't completely wrapped my head around from a Buddhist perspective. Well, I'm going to only, I can only speak for me. Like I said, I wasn't around sure. when the Buddha was here and if this is just my perspective and I'm just a person here. Um, but uh, one of the things that I think, yes, the eightfold path is sort of ethical guidelines. One thing I always say, because when people come to Buddhism and you are right it's it's the people who uh, adopt mindfulness and like want to throw everything else out um they they get all turned off you know they they think it's like you know uh, moses and the tablet and all this stuff and that you know thou shalt not thou shalt not thou shalt not and in in the case of buddhism they come and they think well right 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 i i i do an introductory course as well as a sangha and when people come to the introductory course they get all hung up on right they start sweating and what right mean what is right what is this right business and i mm. said well the buddha used the term right and by the way just like his the first noble truth is life is suffering and i know you've heard this before suffering is a sort of a mistranslation it me yeah. that's not really what the point is from the sanskrit or pali it's it's about it's mostly about life is not always perfectly satisfying every day. Yeah. Yes. I call it anxious discontent. Exactly. Or I called it in my book, life is crappy sometimes, you know, that's it. Yeah. Um, but um, in the, the, the eightfold path, right is a mistranslation. It doesn't mean do the right thing. Mm. It mm. means do the most skillful me thing. It's sort of like ah. it's sort of like having a golf coach or a tennis coach or something. And they mm. say, now don't don't bring your backhand that back that far because you're going to overswing and you're not going to be straight or whatever. I I play a little golf, so not I'm a hack. But the the point is is that that's me. That's like. I want to play golf with a Buddhist because I know you're completely in the moment and you're only seeing the ball. Baloney. You would never let anything <laughs> distract you. And you would you wouldn't watch where the ball's going as you hit it. <laughs> Baloney and ask my Golfing wife Golfing with Buddhists. <laughs> ask my wife what I say after all those crappy shots. And then you'll know you're not playing with a Buddhist. But but anyway, yeah, right means this is the most skillful way to do it, because if you do it this way, you're less likely to hurt yourself or hurt others, hmm. which is essentially ethics, right? Hmm. 
It's ethical. Mm. The whole point of ethics is so we don't hurt other people, right? That's now you go to the word ethics, which is very interesting because for me, compass. I think of ethics. Well, I think of ethics as being ethics are a little bit more secular in terms of like contemporary laws and ways of doing things that people that are mutually agreed on. And I mean, that, maybe I have a misconception, whereas morality kind of comes from a higher place. Is there anything in the Buddha's teaching where this skillful path, doing the skillful thing, um, yeah, comes see, this... from some other, I don't want to say God, but like the, that dharmic uh, being in kind of the peaceful yeah. dharmic harmony comes from, from the Buddha, right? I mean, the Buddha is the, is the embodiment of that. Well, yeah, um, I hear where you're going with this. I hear what you're saying, but the Buddha was only awake. Uh, mm -hmm. He he wasn't a deity. Mm -hmm. He's not like Jesus, who is also God, who is also Jesus, who is also human, is also you know he's not that. He's mm -hmm. he's just a guy. He woke up. He woke up, and he woke mm -hmm. up enough to be able. To, now he woke up enough to be able to have some sort of omniscience and see all his past lives and everybody else's past lives. And that's the mythology around it. Mm, you mm. can buy it. You can not buy it. That's the deal. But, mm. but I think morality has sort of a, I try to, since I've been doing this podcast five years, I know what words kind of make people go nutsy. Right. So I <laughs> try to avoid them. <laughs> uh, so morality, I think, is one of those. And that's one of the things that when people come in to my introduction course, they 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 think right equals moral, like Moses and the Ten Commandments. Right. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to say that's less that and more this. So that's mm -hmm. why I would use ethics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Good. That's great. Well, uh, we were talking about these, uh, one of them is uh, no clergy, uh, which some Buddhists believe that Buddhism has no clergy. And then if you go to Vietnam on one <laughs> sense and Thailand on the other sense, there it is chock-a-block with clergy. You couldn't have more clergy. Um, there's literally thousands and thousands of them. So... Um, but that's something that the Baha'i faith has that I, I really enjoy. It's a completely democratically elected uh, religion where with um, servant leaders and um, that are elected every year that don't have any power or authority uh, beyond their uh, elected uh, status as administrators. So uh, again, um, it's very easy in the modern world to say religion has caused so much suffering. It's killed millions. It's, it's hand in hand with colonialism. It's hand in hand with racism. Uh, we should abandon it forever in <laughs> our culture in large part, especially in kind of blue state, secular United States has done that. And like you said, you quoted me earlier. I feel like we've thrown the spiritual baby out with the religious bathwater, but what can we learn? from systematizing belief. Uh, and that's what religion is. It's just simply systematized belief within a kind of a mythological construct. And what can we gain? Because we have lost a lot. You know, I don't know that the world is getting better um, it, with us having jettisoned uh, religion. And uh, we've certainly lost a great deal of community. We've also lost a great deal of like meaning and purpose and vision. Um, I'd love, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Like, you, I, I love this idea of the sangha. Kind of, I hadn't really thought of it in that way, and that's 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 really cool. But how have we lost sangha um, by jettisoning anything that's systematized around? Uh, religion. And I know it's, it's different. I mean, you're a Buddhist, you don't go, I don't know what your story is, or what school or whatever. But um, I highly doubt that you have a, a clergy that you're answerable to, unlike, say, a Tibetan Buddhist who would look to the Dalai Lama or other lamas. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, I want to go to the first part of what you just said. And, and I totally agree that I think jettisoning religion is 
has been very bad for us as a culture and as a society. I mean, I get everything you said. I agree with, you know, the, the, the negatives of religion, but, um, you know, I, I, I did this, uh, podcast with Satish Kumar. I don't know if you know of him. He, he did the Mm-mm. peace pilgrimage in, y- years ago, walked around the world. He's in his nineties mm. now. And, um, wonderful guy. You should look him up. And the, 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 the he, I said, well, what you say is that com- people, people's uh, complaint to you is that you're completely idealistic and there's no realism here. And he said, well, the realists have been in power for <laughs> hundreds and hundreds of years. How's that going for us? Right. How's that going for us? So it's like religion, I don't think is any different. The evils of religion are no different than the evils of corporate America or co- the corporate West, mm. in my mm. mind. Now, I'm not going to go all socialist on us here, but I, I really do think that you, you just, again, it's this we when you start labeling things, you get into a whole lot of trouble. So, what was the second part of your question? Oh, uh, it's coming. It's coming. Oh, what is um you wanted to know? What was uh, that? Clear, systematizing. Systematizing. Yeah. System. Systematizing kind of spiritual practice and belief in, in a way that is helpful. Like, is there a way to systematize it in a way that is productive, helpful, and creates increasing bonds of unity and, um, right. you know, helps us as a species on the Star Trek path to move forward. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, by the way, I was a practicing Tibetan Buddhism for about 20 years prior to leaving Tibetan Buddhism for all the reasons that the patriarchy represents, um, the hierarchy of, of Tibetan Buddhism. I have nothing against Mm. the Dalai Lama, but there was, there was just too much of that going on and Shin Buddhism. Well, the path I, for, just quickly, um, I'm a Buddhist, a lay Buddhist minister. Nobody even mm-hmm. heard of a Buddhist minister. Okay, mm-hmm. I'm no, mm-hmm. I'm no priest. I'm not ordained. I am. We we called it inducted, and uh, and the whole point is much like the Baha'i. We're not here to be a leader of anybody. We are here as spiritual companions. Our mm-hmm. teacher, when we were inducted as lay ministers after our training program, which is a, a few years of training, he said, we are to be companions on the path, serving our individual communities as they go through their spiritual journey to help them. And he said, mm-hmm. please, and he was, he was emphatic about this. We just lost our teacher last year, but he said, please do not go out and become teachers, become perfect students. And I Mm. think that is how we build community, but that how do we, back to your question though, how do we, um, I think we do need to systematize. I don't, if we don't systematize, then everybody, um, takes what they want and leaves the rest, right? It's smorgasbord spirituality, which never works. When people come to my group, I always say, or when they write in from the podcast, they always say, what can I do? How should I do? I said, well, you can explore any kind of Buddhist path you want, but pick one and hang around it for a while. Because otherwise, Mm. you're not going to learn anything. You're just mm. going to decide, I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this. This does this. I don't want to do that. How does that help? So yes, mm. systematizing is very important, I think. Yeah. And it, I think that's where, you know, a lot of spiritual paths uh, line up kind of politically, kind of like on the political left off, oftentimes, and it's a point that I make in the book, yeah. systematization is viewed as evil in and of itself. Right, but right. you know what? The other side, the forces of racism, of materialism, of greed, um, they're very well organized. They really know how to systematize. They do it so, so well. Oh, okay. And yeah. if we think that we're going to fight them by when we feel like it, engaging <laughs> in some little protest here or there and not like building, you know, coalition and... Uh, then we're we're sadly sadly mistaken. Um, I I quote uh, 
Bertrand Russell in the book, and he says, like, uh, if I'm going to, I might misparaphrase it. He says, um, if, if you, it's essentially like, if you want to build, if you want to change the system, don't tinker with it, but build a new system that makes the old system obsolete. Absolutely. So, and that's one thing I would love to see a little bit more as people of all faith traditions kind of having that conversation. Like, how do we build new systems that make, can, you talk about the patriarchy, I'll talk about consumerism, you can yeah. talk about capitalism, you know, whatever it is. Um, these systems don't work and no. they're rapidly breaking down and they're going to really break down um, even kind of contemporary quote unquote democracy is going to break down. And we see that happening more and more like how can we learn from our spiritual traditions to create a new system that makes the old system obsolete. And maybe that's overreach, but I, I truly believe that there are some answers to be found in the great ways, wisdom and faith traditions, all of them. And we can be humble students, as you say, not teachers, but humble students to all the world's faith traditions and yeah. use those tools to help, uh, help transform and make the world a more beautiful garden. Absolutely. And I, 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 I beautifully said, I think that's exact, that's exactly right. And that's what I was saying about what S Satish Kumar said. It's like, you know, we gave all these, uh, realists a chance and they blew it. Like we're at the verge of extinction. So I think it's time for our, those of us who are idealists to, to get in and recreate the world. Right. And, and that's kind of what he was saying. Um, you, uh, you offered those 10 additional principles and, and one of them was like the, the no clergy, which is cool. And of course, another one, which I have to emphasize because here I am a woman central centrality of the divine feminine and profound connection to the natural world. That's so important. And you mentioned in that section that you actually quoted from Merlin stone in her book, when God was a woman, um, about how religions whose deities were feminine were at the core of the earliest religions on earth. Now, I recently released a podcast with a podcast episode. Actually, it was the one I just released with Clark Strand. He was a former Zen monk and he's a haiku teacher and mm. uh, an author and lecturer on spirituality, ecology and religion. And in that episode, he said something I think you'll get a kick of. He said he talked, he he spent 20 years trying to get patriarchy right, realizing it was. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. That's and, good. And, and to discover, he said, that there was always a religion within a religion, one that is based on mm. inner traditions that are only available to the simple. That's us, right? We've got mm. it. And essentially mm. centered on ecology and the divine feminine. There are so many important and critical, uh, it's critical for us to feel a connection to Mother Earth, right? Of practices that could help soothe our cynicism, which, you know, stop our doom scrolling and, 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 and kind of calm our climate angst. Um, you have anything more to say about that subject? <laughs> um, if you have time, you've said it beautifully, but yeah. So if you sociologically speaking, if you go back to the roots, uh, all of, uh, humanity's spirituality was centered around the feminine right. and that has to do with the seasons and fecundity of spring and the giving of birth and, you know, the, the birthing season of the animals of the lambs and, and, you know, having children and goddesses and, and there was something so healing about that, about centering women and putting the feminine as the, as the most important force in the world right. and honoring that. And we could learn so much from our ancestors from over 10,000 years oh, ago yeah. about how to do that and that the, how femininity and nature itself are intertwined in such a beautiful way. And I feel like as a more masculine element, like part of my journey is to witness and serve and learn from the feminine and support the feminine and not dominate and not, uh, 
you know, um, try and, and know it all or think I have the best way or, or what have you, but be in kind of humble service to that, to that energy. Believe me, my wife agrees with this 100%. <laughs> it took me a while to learn. But I think, you know, about 10,000 years ago, you know, you talk about the patriarchy, but the patriarchy went hand in hand with the kind of, you know, uh, imperialism and colonialism, right? Um, you know, before Columbus colonialism. And then the feminine was obliterated. And, and then we see these kind of like, god king zeus type of stuff yeah. happening and uh and where gods were power and gods were war and our god we defeated you in war so then you have to worship our gods our daddy god our sky daddy and um yeah we've we've got our work to do you know yes. we've got our work to do uh in that but it's uh it's 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 a beautiful way of of seeing the world yeah, and you you ended the book sort of in chapters nine, ten, and the conclusion. That I know we're getting to the end of our time here, so I just want to kind of wrap up what I was going to say about that. Um, uh, in chapter nine, you you talk about the broken blue marble and ecological disaster, um, and in that chapter, you highlight. And I talk a lot about this in a lot of my episodes with a lot of my podcast guests, because I think it's sort of the, the angst of our time. Um, you highlight the tension between, you know, cynicism, cynicism, doom scrolling and progress and hope. Right. It's like this mm. this clash of the forces. And it's so hard to stay hopeful, like you said, in this this time of, um, you know, everything political and authoritarianism and climate change mm. and all that. Mm. But, mm. um, and, and you, and it's like you said in the book, are things getting better or are they falling apart? And what I loved what you said was you said our, it was a quote and now I forget who it was strangely disordered world. Um, mm. And I think that sums it up a lot. It's like, you know, there is hope to be had. There is progress. And this is what you talk about in the last mm. part of the book. So I don't, sometimes when we get in these subjects with my podcast guests, it, it can be kind of a downer, you know? And it's like, it's nice to, I know we need a spiritual revolution, but but there is some hope there, right? There, There's definitely some hope. Um, yeah, so I talk about this concept, and it is a, a one that I lift from the Baha'i faith, because I think it's really important for young people to hear. And that is, you look around, and there's so much falling apart, and there's so much crap, and there's so much pessimism. And I address that too. one of my, you know, seven, you know, uh, anchors for a spiritual revolution is that we need to keep hope alive, right? And we need to foster joy and spread right. joy to others. One thing I just was reading about the Dalai Lama, which I love about him is like, they say, why are you laughing so much? You know, your people are being shot and oppressed. And, and he said, I'm a professional laugher. And I love, <laughs> I love that idea. You would love that. that. <laughs> yeah. But, but that idea that spirituality can be joyful, you know, it's not somber and precious. It can be joyful and spreading of joy giving joy to others is oftentimes the greatest service we can give to others yeah. to make them laugh, to, yeah. to share a laugh with them, to spread, even if we're not feeling it in our own hearts, hopefully we are, but even if we're not to spread and share joy is one of the highest services that we can render. So, and it is really imperative that we keep hope alive and that we, uh, anchor ourselves to hope and progress and change and a belief that things will get better. Because if we sink into pessimism and sink into um, the negative uh, cynicism, which is very easy to fall into, believe me, I fall into it all the time, then nothing changes. And that right. systematized forces of darkness, Lord Voldemort, you know, <laughs> incarnate, um, yeah. is... Uh, they're very well organized and they would love us to be cynical and pessimistic, right? Yeah. So <clears throat> that's that's a really important part. But going back to this idea in the strangely disordered world, which was referenced by Shoghi Effendi, who was a great uh, spiritual leader of the Baha'i faith, there are twin forces at operation, the forces of disintegration 
and the forces of integration. So in the Me Too movement, in Black Lives Matter, in the ecology movement, um, there are so many beautiful movements, even at the grassroots level that are, you know, uh, on, on a much smaller level um, that are making the world better. Mm. And of course there's climate change and materialism and wall street and, and racism and police brutality and the war in Ukraine and, you know, all kinds of social injustices. And we see the world kind of falling apart. So young people, they don't know where to focus. Yeah. So right. my point is like, focus on the integration, wherever you find integration, focus on that work on that, bring, bring hope and joy toward the forces of integration that you see around you. That is the perfect place to end, I think, because we ended it on hope. So there is a million things I could talk to you about. I have like a thousand and one margin notes and stuff, but uh, another time, it's the end of this time. So um, I will, of course, post links to where people can find out more about you as if they don't know who you are. And but before we close, is there anything else you wanted to add? Yes, I do. I want to say that you must be an extraordinary Buddhist to <laughs> bring such light and wisdom and joy to the city of Rochester. You live in <laughs> Rochester. It would, take a, it would take an, a very evolved Buddhist to live uh, in Rochester. So that's yeah. amazing. I salute you. Well, I have to say, do you know that uh, the Rochester Zen Center, one of the most famous Zen centers in all the world, was founded because the Zen monk said, this is the perfect place for a meditation temple because with this lousy weather, there is nothing else you can do here. So <laughs> That's a very practical, uh, <laughs> practical spiritual solution. <laughs> All uh, right. Wendy, it has been a profound pleasure. Thank you for having me on your show. What a delightful conversation. I hope we can have more in the future. Thank you. I hope so too, Rain. Thank you. That's it for this episode. You can find more about Rain in the show notes, including a link to buy the book, Soul Boom, Why We Need a Spiritual, spiritual Revolution. Next up, as always, some announcements. I hope some of you actually stick around to listen to these because honestly, they do change. And some new announcement about upcoming programs or other details may be perfect for you, maybe just what you're looking for. As always, a reminder that you can join me and others in the private donation-supported Everyday Sangha that meets virtually via Zoom every other week on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. The Sangha is currently in the last part of a study of the book Heart of the Shin Buddhist Path, A Life of Awakening by Takamoro Shigaraki. A new study, though, will be announced very soon, so keep an eye out on my social media postings or the Everyday Buddhism website for details. Our meetings consist of a service first, including a short meditation period, traditional vow recitations, and other invocations like refuge bodhisattva vows, and some chanting. The service introduces more ritual and liturgy into the structure of our meeting, much like you would find at a non-virtual Buddhist temple, church, or sangha. The service includes a Dharma talk by one of the practice leaders or myself, Wendy Shinyo Sensei, and many times a Dharma glimpse by a volunteer Sangha member. After the service, we open it up to discussion of the current book study or of anything that was inspired by one of the Dharma talks. Consider joining the Sangha right now to be a part of the upcoming new study and the practice and a warm, welcoming Sangha committee. You can learn more about the Sangha by viewing the latest bonus YouTube podcast, 
one of the latest bonus YouTube podcasts where me, Bradley Janayo sensei and Terry Hoskin, those two are our practice leaders, who talk about what the Sangha is and what everyday Buddhism is all about. You can also support this podcast and the other activities of everyday Buddhism by becoming a community member for $5 a month. If you do, you will have access to all members-only podcasts, an education series, and a private group on a non-Facebook platform. I recently released a new members-only podcast as well. It is the first of, hopefully, a multi-part members-only podcast series responding to a listener question about religion and Buddhism. I hope to release the second of this planned three-part series soon. And the next Introduction to Buddhism course will start on Wednesday, September 13th, 2023 at 7.30 p.m. U.S. Eastern Daylight Time. These intro courses are free to members of the membership community or the Everyday Sangha. Now, if you don't follow me or Everyday Buddhism on any social media platforms we post in, you can go to the Everyday Buddhism website and join the membership community or the Everyday Sangha. Go to www.everyday-buddhism.com and click on either the tab that says Join Members Community or Join Everyday Sangha. Or you can join through Patreon at patreon.com forward slash everyday Buddhism. Also, if you are interested in the course, go to the link on the website and the link is Introduction to Buddhism Course and Registration. If you click on that link, you'll find out everything you need to know about the upcoming course. I thank all of you who contribute this podcast and the community and the Sangha depend on your donations to continue to exist. I don't seek podcast sponsors and don't ask for financial commitments through paid podcast memberships. So my work and the costs needed to support what I do is entirely self-funded, except for your donations. Please consider a one-time or continuing donation through Patreon or on my website's donate tab. You can also buy me a coffee on the coffee cup link on the website. You can find all these links in the show notes. And thanks too to all of you who write in with comments and questions. As the latest bonus member podcast illustrates, I read your emails and may even pick your question to feature in a bonus podcast. Another way you can help is to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It's important to share the podcast with others if you find it helpful in your life. And if you could, take a minute to comment so people will know why you love Everyday Buddhism. That's all for the announcements for this time. So until next time, keep finding ways to make yours and everyone's days better. (laughs) 